Hello everybody and welcome to your 43rd chapter in your Java E7 tutorial series. In this tutorial, we'll be talking about creating fetch plans with entity graphs. So many times in an application's lifetime, you may need to get large amounts of data, usually similar data too. Getting this large amount of data can take a lot of time if you're getting them one at a time. Instead, why don't you just call them all at once? Fetch plans can be used by application developers to group together related persistent fields to improve runtime performance and save you time. Fetch plans use entity graphs, which are basically templates for certain persistence queries or operations. An example of this would be in a video streaming application. A user, when he first opens up the website, wants to see the video's title and the video's thumbnail first before anything else. A developer can organize these important fields into a collection and fetch the following priority data like decorations lazily. Now let's get into the basics of entity graphs. This example shows you how to use fetch attributes to set certain properties to be eager, which means that these will be loaded before the others. The default entity um, graph for this entity would contain the message ID, subject, and sender fields, but not the body or attachment fields. Now, these entity graphs can be one of two types, a fetch or a load. Fetch graphs will treat all attributes you specified in your entity to be eager, while all attributes that are not specified will be lazy. See, in this example over here, you can see that all the examples, for example, if you set your property to Java, javax.persistence.fetchgraph, it will set this as a fetch entity graph. Then there's load, which uh, if your entity graph is set to load, then all attributes specified or not will be eagerly fetched, which means that everything will be um, fetched eagerly. Next, let's take a look into our named entity graphs. So to apply uh, named entity graph annotations to entity classes, what we have to do is put this at named entity graph annotation. In this annotation, we have no fields that are included in the uh, attribute nodes. And the fields are not annotated with metadata to set the fetch type. So the only field that will be eagerly fetched over here in either a load graph or fetch graph is the message ID since it's annotated with at ID. In this example, so this will be our default. So in this example over here, um, it specifies the name of the entity graph, which is our email entity graph, and the fields of the entity that should be included in the entity graph. So over here, subject and sender. Now you can actually send multiple named entity graph definitions, which may be applied to a class by grouping them within a named entity graphs annotation. In this annotation over here, you can see that first of all, one is for a preview pane, which fetches only the sender subject and the body message. And the other is a full view of the message, including any attachments that are sent through the message. Next, let's take a look into using entity graphs in query operations. Now let's use these newly created entity graphs into our query operations. In this example over here, you can first call the set hint method on the query object and specify either jax.persistence.loadgraph or fetch graph as the property name and an entity instance as the value. Over here, you can see it's eg. Here is an equivalent used in typed queries. And that's it. That's all there is about our creating fetch plans with entity graphs. I hope you learned a lot about this tutorial. And in the next tutorial, we will be talking about using a second level cache with JPA applications. Until then, I will see you in the next video.